Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 46, How Psychiatry and Big Pharma Gaslight Us, featuring Bruce Levine. This episode might be the most controversial that I've produced so far. Please note that it is not intended to disrespect anyone who has suffered mental health issues. Indeed, I myself have experienced episodes of depression throughout my life, some of them quite acute. However, this episode does refute certain popular beliefs about the causes and treatments of mental health disorders, and as such, some people might find it upsetting. Most people are familiar with the chemical imbalance theory, which posits that mental health disorders are caused by too much or too little of particular neurotransmitters in the brain. For example, it's been claimed that depression is a result of a lack of serotonin. So people suffering depression are prescribed a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, an SSRI, such as Prozac, Paxil, or Zoloft. There's a big problem with the chemical imbalance theory, though. It's not true. It's been repeatedly disproven, and it is not recognized as valid in the field of psychiatry. Regardless, it is still widely believed, both in popular culture and among many healthcare professionals. I first learned about the baselessness of chemical imbalance theory from the work of Bruce E. Levine. Bruce is a practicing clinical psychologist who writes and speaks about how society, culture, politics, and psychology intersect. His most recent book is Resisting Illegitimate Authority, A Thinking Person's Guide to Being an Anti-Authoritarian, Strategies, Tools, and Models. I've been an admirer of his work for several years now, so it was a true pleasure to have a conversation with him. Bruce and I talked on December 17, 2020, and we covered a lot of ground. Among the subjects we discussed, critiquing the defect model of mental illness, how psychiatry resembles religion, the financial motivations of big pharma, that SSRIs are no more effective than placebos in clinical trials, the lack of connection between depression and serotonin levels, how Big Pharma load the dice in their studies, how Big Pharma influences the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, known as the DSM, the subjectivity of diagnosing mental health issues, when anti-authoritarian people are diagnosed as mentally ill, how blaming individuals for their mental difficulties gives a pass to systemic factors, the role of trauma in adversely affecting mental health, the importance of community and its role in healing, the recent legalization of psilocybin mushrooms in Oregon, and his recent book. Again, no insult is meant to anyone who has experienced emotional difficulties in their life. But we must dispense with some myths if we're going to move on together and build a healthy society. clinical psychologist and I've been in practice here in Cincinnati, Ohio for almost 35 years, but uh, I work these days half time and mostly I do a lot of writing. So I write uh, a lot of articles for places like Alternate and Truth Out and used to write for Z Magazine and write for various periodicals and and I publish books. The last uh, book uh, that I wrote was a book called Resisting Illegitimate Authority. And it was a book about uh, anti-authoritarians, a book for anti-authoritarians, and it was published by uh, AK Press in uh, 2018. I wanted to start off going from an article that you wrote in 2016 called Psychiatry's Defect Model of Mental Illness, A Path for Those It Has Failed. And you open the article by saying, depressed, anxious, and substance abusing people can beat themselves up for being defective. 
and psychiatrists and psychologists routinely validate and intensify their sense of defectiveness by telling them that they have, for example, a chemical imbalance defect, a genetic defect, or a cognitive behavioral defect. In plain words, many depressed, anxious, and substance-abusing persons think, I feel fucked up because I am essentially fucked up, and mental health professionals routinely confirm this. I just wanted to start there because I feel like there's a lot of like blaming the victim or one could even maybe say gaslighting going on from psychology and psychiatry. I would agree. Uh, it's a very tricky issue because some people like their diagnosis and we can get into why some people like it. Some people hate their diagnosis for exactly the reasons that I, I was stating in that article was that they don't like being seen as being defective, biochemically, genetically defective, when they're not, um, when there's other reasons why they're behaving the way they're behaving. Um, but for those people um, who are, they're certainly uh, professional psychiatrists, pharmaceutical companies, certainly want people uh, to feel defective, uh, biochemically defective, genetically defective, and psychologists uh, want folks to feel uh, cognitively, behaviorally <laughs> defective um, because they're, they're going to be a patient then and they're going to be somebody that they can make money off of. Um, so it, it's, it's one of those things in life that, that there's, it really is a divisive issue, um, one of many divisive issues in the whole psychiatry realm of those people who really um, are attached to their diagnoses and those people who despise their diagnoses. Uh, just a quick story on that. Um, with all the kind of uh, changes in cultures uh, over the last 20 years or so, uh, young people, millennial folks, um, tell me, Bruce, you got to look at these Tumblr accounts. These people have it in their profile. They have their diagnoses, and they and they show me they have in their diagnoses pro in their profiles. They have borderline personality disorder. And I'm saying, you kidding me? Borderline personality disorder? That's the diagnosis that psychiatrists they they're terrified of people who with borderline personality disorder. That's somebody like Glenn, the Glenn Close character in Fatal Attractions. Somebody who's unstable. Somebody who doesn't care about boundaries and relationships. Somebody who's self destruct somebody who'll take revenge if they're not getting what they wanted and, and I'm telling and so but there's a lot of folks out there that they embrace their borderline diagnosis and they, they're not aware of it when a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist refers um, a, a, a patient to another professional and says they're borderline um, it's the, that, that other that professional who's getting that referral um, is feeling like what what, am, what are you trying to get me back so it's a it's a whole kind of crazy thing about people uh, embracing their diagnoses. And, we, you know, there's a lot of reasons we could get into why people embrace their diagnosis. It's a sort of a sad commentary on our society. I mean, the simple answer is that's the only way they feel like they can get any kind of compassion. Um, and that's a pretty sad commentary on society. Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely, I see a lot of this kind of pride almost in the different designations that people have. And I see it not just there, I see it in other places too. I used to work at a natural food store in Portland, Oregon, and people had a similar kind of pride in the different food allergies that they believe that they had as well. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I, you know, I guess some things is just, for some folks, it's a way of uh, having an identity. I suppose some folks uh, get attention. But in, for, in, in the whole realm of uh, psychiatry, a lot of it is, is a way of this, you know, this is, you know, say, for, for example, somebody's very depressed and they're immobilized and they, they, they're not able to do anything and they don't want to be blamed for being lazy or for being irresponsible. And the only way that they feel like they can get under un, understanding and compassion is to uh, embrace a medical uh, diagnosis. Of course, they're, for other people who've got these serious mental illness diagnoses like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder is also other kind of secondary gain in terms of getting, um, you know, getting disability payments. So there's that element. But for most people, there's not that element. There's more like this is the only way that I can kind of get folks to sort of give me some empathy, give me some understanding. Um, like if, if, you know, and it's sort of sad because uh, in our society, if you were to just tell, there, there's a real downside to that because once people Oh, you know, once people are also accepting the idea that they have, you know, they're behaving destructively or they're behaving problematically because they have some sort of a brain disease, some kind of genetic disease, some kind of biochemical disease, what goes along with that is a heightened stigma. 
So it's a, it's a strange thing. The research shows that people are less blamed for their behavior, but nobody wants to be around them. <laughs> so they get more stigmatized. So, for example, if, you know, they've done studies, for example, where somebody tells somebody, tells another person that they've been psychiatrically hospitalized because they have a biochemical brain disorder. And, um, yeah, they get some acceptance for, and, and they get blamed less, but nobody, nobody wants to be around that person. Whereas if you tell somebody, for example, something really horrible happened in life, my uh, parents beat me up, I got traumatized, in other words, I was really depressed or crazy because of these psychological reasons, trauma, social reasons, they're, they're less likely to be stigmatized in the sense that people can sort of more connect with that. They can say like, well, yeah, that could have been me. So this, this kind of idea of I, taking on a disease and really wanting to have it be caused by some kind of biochemical defect um, this idea that psychiatry is sort of perpetuated, not the American Psychiatric Association, a National Alliance for Mentally Ill, this idea that you need to view these things as diseases like any other. This is their slogan, an attempt to destigmatize. Well, it actually works the opposite way because to the extent that people view people behaving in crazy ways or immobilized, depressed ways, because they have a kind of chemical disease, people are more other. People don't want to be around them. They're less likely to be friends with them. They're less likely to go out on a date with them. Yeah, and I want to stress, too, just that I have all the empathy in the world for people who are feeling any of these things. I myself, throughout my through my teen years and into my 20s, I experienced a lot of depression that was at times uh, debilitating. And there were definitely times when I had very strong suicidal urges. And so I feel like I've, I've been to these depths, you know, and I'm quite familiar with them. And at this point in my life, I'm uh, 51. And so I've found some different ways of dealing with them. But for me personally, I never wanted a label. I never felt like I wanted to look at things in terms of what was wrong with me, in part because I was raised Catholic and that's all about making you feel bad. There's the whole original sin that everything, you know, that yes, there's something wrong with you. There is something intrinsically wrong with you. That was itself a cause of depression and the suicidal ideations and me leaving the church and leaving that behind was really important. And of course, I didn't want to just take that on in another form, you know? And so I feel like the, the Christian underpinnings in our society that tell people that yes, there's something wrong with you just as being a human who's alive, you have some evil in you. I feel like that's behind some of this as well. Yes, I mean, there are some dim, very uh, clear parallels for me between psychiatry and organized religion. And in that one being, I mean, there's others like the Bible, the psychiatry has their own Bible, the diagnostic Bible, the DSM, which is very much a lot of parallels between the, the scriptures, the Bible, that's more famous one. Um, but the idea of any kind of uh, sort of professional class, whether they're clergy or psychiatry, deciding um, what is a disease and, and that who is defective um, is really creates a certain power um, for that professional class. And that's why they do it. That's why, you know, that's, that's a big reason why you have, um, especially more, the more orthodox uh, religion, organized religion, the more they want to have power and control over their congregants, and so the more they're going to emphasize sin. And that, you know, there's something essentially defective about you that only if you go through our process will you be able to fix. That gives them power. And the same thing is very much a parallel in psychiatry to the extent that somebody um, is, is told like, well, they have this kind of biochemical brain disease. And the only way that you're going to uh, let go of this defect is, well, you'll never be able to let go of this defect, but we'll be able to treat it so that you'll be able to walk around normally. Think about, in contrast, how much more liberating it would be if you were told, and I'll ask you this, being a depressed teenager thinking back, if somebody were to tell you, a doctor were to tell you, you know why you were depressed? You know, it's one thing for sure is probably because you got a brain in your head and you were looking around and you probably saw a lot of injustices, maybe in society at large, maybe in your family, maybe in your school system. Maybe you were, maybe you were pained, overwhelmingly pained by, by what you were seeing, how crazy, how unjust, how unfair, how insane the world was. 
And because you had a brain in your head and because you were a critical thinker, but by the way, we have lots of research that shows the more, the more people, and this was more famous in the 1970s before the drug companies sort of annexed psychiatry, there was a lot of research that showed the more that people were critical thinkers, the more they were vulnerable to depression. Well, think, how, think what that would do to somebody who was depressed to start thinking about it. Well, maybe that's just, it's a double-edged sword. Maybe if you're a thinking, critical thinking person with a soul, you're more vulnerable to being depressed but that's 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 not the way now nowadays that psychiatry deals with people who are depressed right and speaking of how they deal with them now a lot of it has to do with pharmaceuticals obviously the financial gains that the pharmaceutical industry has gotten they've had a motivation to be supporting all of this well, absolutely. I mean, you saw it like back in 30, 40 years ago, almost nobody took antidepressants <laughs> in America. It was very, very rare. It's people who were in psychiatric hospitalizations. Oh, but certainly almost nobody took antipsychotic drugs. Now these things are handed out like candy. I mean, you see these commercials on television where they tell folks, oh, yeah, if your antidepressant isn't working, go go drop some Abilify along with it. Well, and Abilify is an antipsychotic. I mean, for those of us who are a little bit older, it's a sort of staggering, you know, how anti, you know, antipsychotics are basically now used kind of like chill pills. This is a major tranquilizing drug that has all kinds of adverse effects. And the antidepressant revolution really you know, why that becomes a routine thing for people to, to take. It's a couple of things. One was this kind of mythical uh, serotonin imbalance for depression, which was disproven, by the way, we could get into it if you're interested. By the 1990s, this whole idea that people were depressed because they had low levels of serotonin, this was completely disproved. They did a lot of research on this, but psychiatry, you know, they kept quiet on this or they, or they spoke, they said there was. And, and so, only very recently, by like 2011, you had leading figures in psychiatry saying that uh, there, there was no, there's no such thing as a chemical brain imbalance myth. It's urban legend. This is the words of a guy named Ronald Pies, who's uh, editor emeritus of the Psychiatric Times. But the funny thing is, well, it's not so funny, but psychiatry, who does they blame this perpetuation of this chemical imbalance myth? They blame it on drug companies, and they also blame it on people like me, critics. They say critics have been blaming psychiatry unfairly, that psychiatry never talked about this. Yet we have tons of evidence of leading figures in psychiatry, plus many people over and over again who've gone to their psychiatrist, and not just their psychiatrist, their primary care physician. Most, most antidepressants are prescribed by just regular primary care folks who, who believe this chemical imbalance idea and, and they you know and they use it to get folks to feel comfortable not only taking these drugs themselves but giving them to their children because all of a sudden it's this idea that it's like well it's like you got diabetes you don't have enough insulin well you don't you got depression you don't have enough serotonin so it's a, it a fantastic marketing technique and that's why that's why everybody's on antidepressants or why you've got 11% of America on it, 23, 24% of women over the age of 40 on it. You've got drug commercials, which, by the way, have not always been the case in America. A lot of folks who are under 30 or so, they don't remember. But it's only as of 1995 that, the, uh, that these drug commercials were allowed on, on television. Most of the industrial world still does not allow these drug companies to put these commercials on television, telling them to ask their doctor. So between these drug commercials on TV, between this biochemical brain imbalance falsehood, and between you know the sort of psychiatric pharmaceutical industrial complex where so basically, these drug companies kind of annex psychiatry in the 1980s, which is a whole other story. That's that's how it is that you've got so many people on these antidepressants. Now, you're going to have some people out there who say, OK, these, these antidepressants saved my life. They're fantastic drugs. Yet, if you take a look at the actual research, they don't work that great. Now, this is upsetting for a lot of people because they go like, wow, before I took my Prozac and my Lexapro, I was miserable. Now I'm doing fine. Well, that's the case for almost any treatment, including bloodletting, you're going to have that. So in real research, you do these <laughs> randomized control, double blind. This is what you got to do. When you take a look at real research, these drugs really don't do much better than placebos. Um, and that's in drug company dice loaded studies. OK, so. There's a lot. Of, I mean, I, it should surprise people. It's always interesting for me that people who are progressives who really are cynical of the military industrial complex, the energy industrial complex, when it comes to uh, psychiatry and drug companies, I mean, they, they really um, lose their critical thinking. And I think part of that 
is because you get so scared, when you get so depressed, when you get so immobilized, um, you kind of lose your brain. And I think that's what happens with a lot of people. I want to really underline this point that you made about the SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, examples of which are Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, right? That these Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Selexa, um, Lexapro, that whole that whole group, the SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Right, because in the popular mind, this is still common currency that there's a chemical imbalance causes depression and that these SSRIs are the way to treat it. This is still very common. Yes, it's still, I mean, there's a, I haven't done a, a poll recently, but I saw one in 2006, where it's 80% of Americans still believe that, uh, that people were depressed because they had low levels of serotonin, but it's very similar to WMD. So, you know, it's a, it's a common thing when, you know, somebody says thing louder and loud enough that the weapons of mass destruction, you know, Iraq had it, weapons of mass destruction, that's what we had to go invade. Actually, if you take a look to this day, uh, at least when you're talking about Republicans, the majority of Republicans still believe that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, even though, you know, they've been told a lot that they were never found there. Well, in the case of SSRIs, people heard it so much, and it was so, you know, so quietly retracted by psychiatry um, that, I, that I, I end up going around having to repeat over and over again um, that, you know, the, the, the studies on that and that there are like, you know, to, right now, the leading figures in psychiatry um, have rejected. So, like, for example, a guy named Ronald Pies I was talking about before, it's like editor, in chief, uh, editor emeritus and chief of Psychiatric Times, he said, and I go, I repeat this quote over and over again, he said in 2011, in truth, the chemical imbalance notion was always a kind of urban legend never a theory seriously propounded by well-informed psychiatrists, okay? Now, for those of you in your audience who are feeling like, nobody should feel stupid that they don't know that, because here's another story. The next year, the first kind of real significant media description of this came out in 2012, not on television, but on radio. Um, I don't know if folks know about the correspondent, Elise Spiegel, um, at National Public Radio. But the interesting thing for Spiegel is that her, actually she's the granddaughter of a, a former president of the American Psychiatric Association, a guy named John Spiegel. And so she does, she finds out somewhere along the line that this serotonin thing is a myth. And here's the thing for her, here she comes from a prestigious background. She tells this whole story on air about how when she was 17 years old, she was incredibly depressed. Her parents had some wherewithal. They took her to the prestigious Johns Hopkins, um, and they told her that same story, the psychiatrist there, is that it's like you've got diabetes, it's in your brain, that your serotonin is too low. We can give you a chemical to cure that chemical imbalance. This is what she was told. And later, she finds out that this is not true, and she goes and she interviews researchers involved. It's a very interesting story, uh, and it's still, it's still archived there on NPR. People can see the transcript or they can listen to it. And, you know, she goes and talks to some of these researchers. She talks to one of these guys, a guy named Frazier, Alan Frazier, who's at the, psych, uh, at the psychiatry department at the University of Texas. And he says, yeah, we knew it was a myth. But, well, you know, if, if people have this biological reason for feeling depressed, and then they're more likely to take their antidepressants. And that's a good thing. And another guy, what's even more interesting for me, another guy she talks to is a guy named Pedro Delgado, who actually did some of the early research in the 1990s. 1990s that disproved this uh, uh, this idea that uh, th that serotonin was the source too low a serotonin was the source of depression. We can talk about how that research was done, but he was one of the guys who did the research, and he says this is like mind boggling for me. He says, well, sometimes people need simple explanations, even if they're not true, because complex explanations create uncertainty. So these are all these kind of like noblesse oblige sort of, and they're all idea kind of noble lie ideas that the leading figures in psychiatry have perpetuated this view. My feeling is that the lower level folks in psychiatry and most primary care physicians, they're not engaged in any noble lie. They actually believe this chemical imbalance theory still exists. They're just, they're just ignorant of the truth. But between this noble lie stuff and pure ignorance, this is one of those ideas, just like many ideas in American history, that just goes on and on. And it's just taken hold you know, you repeat something louder over and over again, and it's an appealing idea, and it's very hard to let go. People don't want to let go of that. 
No, absolutely not. I, it just, it's still so common. It frustrates me. And I was reading uh, one of your articles uh, today that in the studies, they found that people who were depressed, some of them had low serotonin, some of them had higher than normal serotonin. Among people who weren't depressed, some of them had low serotonin, some of them had higher than normal. And when they reduced the levels of serotonin in people who were not depressed, they didn't become depressed. And that was really sort of showed that, well, no, there's nothing to this. Right, right. There's a lot of this stuff that was way, you know, over 20 years ago, a guy named Elian Valenstein, he wrote this book called Blaming the Brain. And he's a, he was a professor emeritus of psychology at the University of Michigan. And he goes through all this research. We have it down and documented late as the late 1990s. And he did, they did all kinds of studies. So, for example, to give people an example, of, they did these things called serotonin depletion studies where they, they know what are the precursors that the body needs to make serotonin. And so they depleted those. And again, it didn't affect people's levels of depression. They took a look. Another way that they did in these studies was they know they took a look at the metabolites for a, the serotonin in people's bodily fluids. And so they compared depressed people, non-depressed people, no difference. Okay. So they go, they went at this every which way they can go at to see if, if serotonin levels had anything to do with depression. And this was completely rejected. Like I say, and now, and now finally, well, finally around 2011 leading figures in psychiatry were saying it, but what they were saying is like, you know, we never said any, anything otherwise, <laughs> which was just for me, that's, that's, crazy making that's gaslighting since everybody has heard that from psychiatry and all physicians over and over again and now you've not only told people an untruth now you're making people feel like they're stupid because like they're 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 they're, they're saying stuff that you never said when in fact we have proof all over the place that leading figures in psychiatry and most doctors all over the place have been telling that to their patients and so when you mentioned that there were people who knew that the serotonin thing wasn't for real, but they went along with it with their patients because then their patients would take the pharmaceuticals that they wanted them to take. We then, in another article, you mentioned uh, in December 2010, five myths about depression treatments. Uh, myth number one that you mentioned is that uh, it's a myth that antidepressants are more effective than placebos. Right. There's a, um, a guy, a really interesting study, and, and this got a lot of coverage because <laughs> it's, usually these things get buried and marginalized. But for whatever reason, a guy named Irving Kirsch, he was a very, he, you know, made possibly because he did a lot of research. He did this big study when he was at the University of Connecticut, but eventually he, he moved over to Harvard. So I guess 60 Minutes takes Harvard research is a lot more serious than any other research. But the story between Irving Kirsch is pretty interesting. He he really, when he spent his whole life looking at placebos, not so much looking at antidepressants, because he's very interested in this whole sort of expectations, that if you could get people to expect something, that that had such a powerful Im impact on what, what people, what happened to people. And so he what he did was he wanted to take a look at all the research on antidepressants versus placebos. And he suspected that a lot of the research was not being published that didn't look favorably on these antidepressants. But he knew that all research, um, by the way, people, a lot of people don't know that all this research that's used to for the uh, get, get approval from the Food and Drug Administration, it's all done by drug companies. The Food and Drug Administration doesn't do their own independent research. They just take a look at the research that's given to them by the drug companies. So, for example, Eli Lilly it may, does the research on Prozac, which is their product. Now, what happens, though, is they have to, the drug companies have to register all their trials with the Food and Drug Administration, but they only need two studies that show that the drug is like in the case, Prozac, that it's effective and it's safe. They, they could do 20 studies, but they only need to show two. So what, what Kirsch did, what Irving Kirsch did was, and I don't know why in America you would have to use the Freedom of Information Act to find this information out, but you do. He, he actually used the Freedom of Information Act to go through, go to the FDA and get all published and unpublished studies on a lot of antidepressants, Prozac, Paxil, six, six antidepressants and all. He took a look at 47 studies, and what he found was that overall, that the drug, that the that the that the placebo, that the antidepressant failed to outperform the placebo the majority of the times. And then when you added it up in aggregate, the the antidepressants only slightly 
outperform the placebo in what he he called like clinically negligible. And these you have to understand, these are drug company dice loaded studies. And we could talk about how the drug companies dice load these studies. And But even in these drug company dice loaded studies that are made to make the antidepressants look much better than a placebo, even in those cases, they really never really outperform the placebo. Now, again, when you take a look at these studies, usually somewhere between 30-35% of people on the drug or on the placebo report something positive. And so you're going to see there's plenty of people who are out there in America right now, millions of people, who, tell, who are going to tell you their, their antidepressants saved their life. It was fantastic. This is not science. This is what we call anecdotal studies. In real science, they don't do much better than a placebo, Okay, even in drug, drug company studies. Right. And so some people might say then, well, you know, what's the harm if it does make some people feel better? But there definitely are negative effects from a lot of these different pharmaceuticals, including cases where starting with one pharmaceutical can lead to symptoms becoming worse over time, which then requires stronger ones. So someone starts off with an antidepressant, but then they move up to an antipsychotic and they get worse and the amount and the things that they're taking have to get stronger. Correct. I mean, what happens is too, and there's an interesting study really uh, with a huge subject pool that came out in 2017 um, in the psychotherapy and psychomatics where they looked at like over 3,000 subjects over nine years. And what they found is that, yeah, there were plenty of people that did okay immediately with the short-term benefits of antidepressants, but when you looked in a nine-year follow-up, actually those who did not take medication at all um, did much better than people who took the medication. And one of the things, if you're as old as I am, you know that which uh, there's a fact that somehow has been totally swept under the rug that most people who are depressed, they get better without anything. So, in fact, there was actually a study in 2006, a National Institute of Mental Health, an NIMH study, that showed that, like, really, over the course of a year, 85% um, of people who've been severely depressed do better, okay? So, what the real dilemma, one of the real dilemmas that we're seeing with these antidepressants is you're taking something that could well be an episodic problem, and you're creating a chronic issue with it, okay? And that's what happens, and there's a lot of chemical reasons and psychological reasons why people who view themselves, become viewing themselves as a depressive and who go on significant doses of these antidepressants um, become like a chronically depressed person as opposed to just going through a stretch in their life where they're significantly depressed. That's pretty fascinating and also kind of scary. Yes. But the problem is, again, what you brought up earlier, when you're talking about the mix of capitalism, that's a good thing for providers, and that's a good thing for drug companies. It's much better for them to have, not only to have made the money off of you know, treating somebody, but to have lifelong patients, as opposed to the idea that a lot of folks you know, are, are going to recover naturally without, without their help, okay? And they're not going to have lifelong patients. Can you talk a little bit about what you mentioned a little before about how the drug companies would, you said, quote, dice load their studies? Well, there's a lot of different ways they, they do it. And one of the ones um, is, is just, just the measurements they use, okay, to dictate whether somebody is depressed or not. So most of these antidepressant studies, they use something called the, the Hamilton rating scale, the HAMD scale. And if you take a look, you know, and anybody can do this, you can go and Google, Google this Hamilton rating scale and you can look at the questions yourself and you'd be surprised to find that there's like, so each, each yes question, you know, you get yes, you, you get two points. Well, they have like three questions on this depression scale about insomnia, early insomnia, do you, do you have difficulty falling asleep, do you wake up in the middle of the night, you know, all these different questions about, it. so you can get, if you have a hard time sleeping, you get up to six points, which count towards your depression score, but if you get, you know, if you, there's only one question about suicide, and so even if you want to wish in that you're dead, you only get two points, so you can end up on one of these studies, like in your outcome measure, after taking, let's say you take a Prozac, and then you're measured by the Hamilton rating scale at the end of the study, and they go through it, and it turns out maybe, for whatever reason, this has helped your sleep some, and so your score goes up. You can still be wishing that you were dead, okay, and your depression score goes down. So that's one way, the whole way depression is measured is dice-loaded to make like these drug, drugs look 
more effective because they, they might affect some some symptoms like you know like like your sleep or stuff like that much more than they're going to affect like whether you actually want to kill yourself or not and so another way another way these di- these uh, studies are dice loaded is they have something called placebo washout what does that mean so in the early stages of the depression study if they find that somebody a subject responds to a to a placebo they get kicked out of the study so that affects that affects the study down the road. Another thing, probably for me, maybe the most important way these things are dice loaded, is that if you have a real scientific study, is you have to have a double blind. So that means that both the experimenter and the subject does not know whether they're taking the placebo or the antidepressant. Very important because if you know that it affects your expectation either as the experimenter or the subject, then that's going to really uh, bias the study in a lot of ways. So the problem in all of these antidepressant studies that are done by drug companies, the placebo is a sugar pill. And so it's easy, like when you take these antidepressants, even if they're not lifting your depression, you, you can feel something. They have some side effect, physical side effects, whereas a sugar pill does not. So that makes it very easy to penetrate the double blind, to guess whether you're on the placebo or whether you're on the antidepressant. If you want to do these drug studies scientifically correct, and some have been done, not by drug companies, you use what's called an active placebo. So something not like a sugar pill, something that's not the antidepressant, not therapeutic, but does give you some sort of a, a kind of side effect. And and that, that way it's much more difficult for the patient to, to figure out whether they're taking the placebo or not taking the placebo and you have a truer double blind. So there's a lot of ways the drug companies would never want to do that because they want people to know, they're, they're hoping that people could guess when they're taking the drug or when they're on the placebo. They're, they're, so all of these kinds of things, the drug companies are orchestrating these studies to, to make them look like science, to make them look like they're the gold standard, randomized control, double blind, all this stuff, when they're really not. But the, the interesting thing for me with all these kind of dice loading aspects of these drug studies that are done by the drug companies, these drugs still, these antidepressants still are like the compare when you compare them to a uh, placebo they still don't do great they're still like like I said like Hirsch used the term like when you take these Hamilton scales there's like about two points difference it's like it's like enough maybe to create some minor statistical significance but 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 it's like clinically negligible is the term that a lot of uh, experimenters use and that's with drug company studies okay wow so it's just not good science right 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 Right, right, which we've come to expect uh, in in capitalism, uh, not just with that, but with uh, a lot of other things too, with uh, you know herbicide companies, et cetera. Lots of uh, this kind of funny business goes on. Like, I mean, people have to understand. I mean, you know, there's some decent people in all these drug companies. They're not all devilish, evil people, but. The dynamics of these companies is, is that they know anytime they start a block, their, their dream is to have a blockbuster. So Prozac at its peak was a $2 billion, $3 billion a year drug. All of these, Zoloft, Paxil, all of these drugs at their peak before they go off patent are the are huge. I mean, that's a lot of money, two, three, four billion dollars a year. And once you start this process going and you already put a few million dollars into the early trials, there's a lot of financial incentives for a lot of people to say, yeah, these these drugs work. Um, And then you have other kinds of corruption processes that are really pretty sad that go along with the military industrial complex, the pharmaceutical industrial complex. So you have these revolving doors of people who are like directors of the of the uh, Food and Drug Drug Administration moving on to be board the board of directors at, at these drug companies at Pfizer. Um, th- so this kind of thing happens too, and so the signal is clearly um, made. When, uh, when drug companies give these uh, lucrative uh, jobs to people who leave uh, the Food and Drug Administration, that if you're friendly to these drug companies, there's a there's a there's a there's a nice uh, uh, there's a nice um, lucrative job waiting for you when you come out. Now again, I'm not accusing all of these folks in in these drug in these drug companies of being corrupt. There are some people who like they quit or they have a lot of depression and angst about the conflicts and the pressures. Or they just move into complete denial and can try to convince themselves there's science going on when there's it's really not real science. So another way that this happens with the science being loaded and with the pharmaceutical companies interfering is with the DSM, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the DSM... What, what does DSM stand for? 
Okay, the DSM stands for the Diagnostical Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, and it is a publication by the American Psychiatric Association, which is the guild of American psychiatry. So they publish it. It's a big money maker for them. It's probably their major money maker. Um, is this publication? They regularly revise it. The first one came out in 1952. We're up to the DSM-5, which came out in uh, 2013. It's constantly they're constantly battling over it. It's 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 literally called the Bible, the Diagnostic Bible. And there's a lot of comparisons I can make between the the DSM Psychiatric Bible, Diagnostic Bible, and the actual <laughs> Genesis and Exodus and Deuteronomy. It's um it's it's a Bible where these guys go around, and there it's it's a strange way that diseases diseases are created, literally created. You have a committee at the American Psychiatric Association that sits around and decides what human behaviors they view as mental illnesses, and that they will believe that the majority of Americans will go along with that. So the most obvious case of the ludicrousness in recent years, and from my point of view, they're all scientifically ridiculous. Okay, but you know, here's one that most of the general public, at least in 2020, see how ridiculous it is. Was that up until 1973, homosexuality was a DSM mental illness? How did that come to be? Well, again, the politics of it were that you had prior to you know in the 1940s, 1950s, the battle was between folks who viewed homosexuality, you know, as either a sin or a crime. And then you have these so-called progressives um, who say, like, oh, no, it's really an illness. That'll give compassion to homosexuals, okay? And so they, they create this illness called homosexuality, and they create all these treatments, rather draconian treatments, you know, where they're, like, you know, doing all kinds of stuff basically to make people feel like they're highly defective for having these homosexual thoughts and feelings and behaviors, and it's caused by bad parenting or something biologically wrong with them, and they're, and they're going to fix them. Well, of course, when you had gay activism, by the time you had the late 1960s, you had a Stonewall, and gay activists were sick of being called um, mentally ill for their homosexualities. And so what did they do in a, in a political protest in the, in the early 1970s? They, um, they went after the American Psychiatric Association, and because of the culture, the climate of the era, they were, they were able to successfully get psychiatry to eliminate. In 1973, homosexuality is a mental illness. And so when the DSM-3 came out in 1980, it no longer had homosexuality as a mental illness. But I got to tell you, you know, the thing has gotten a little bigger and bigger. So they got rid of homosexuality as a mental illness through political activism. But a lot of other groups, especially kids, could not put together some political activism to get rid of the new diagnoses that were thrown in there. So you have in 1980 something called oppositional defiant disorder, um, being uh, for uh, kids being diagnosed with that, symptoms being often argue with adults, often refuse to comply with adults. So basically every famous anti-authoritarian <laughs> that's ever existed would have been labeled with oppositional defiant disorder. And, and ultimately a lot of these kids start to get drugged. Okay, so that's the other scary thing that's happened in, in psychiatry is that they can off-label drugs. So off-label um, prescribing means that you could prescribe an antipsychotic for a condition that isn't a psychosis. So you see a lot of these antipsychotics like Seroquel and Abilify and Cyprex and Risperdal, they're being used just basically as chill pills for disruptive populations out there who have you know, who can't protect themselves. So oppositional defiance disorder kids being one of them, but there's other populations. So there's a couple of scientific issues having to do with the DSM that should be obvious to, any, to anybody who knows science 101. One is the whole issue of validity. You know, validity meaning is, is this something, just because you call something an illness, that doesn't mean it is. And that's obvious, hopefully, nowadays for most of your listening audience with homosexuality. I bet you it's obvious for most of them with something like oppositional defiant disorder. It's obvious for me, uh, for a guy like me, for everything in that DSM. But that it's, it's not so obvious for a lot of other people because a lot of these other behaviors do seem bizarre and strange to them. So they're more willing to call them mental illnesses. So validity is one issue. The other scientific issue is something called reliability. So even if you believe 
you know, oppositional defiant disorder or ever, all these, including schizophrenia, if you believe these are valid mental illnesses, you can't get clinicians to agree on them. Um, and so you can't, or if you have the same person go to two or you know two different clinicians, they're just as likely to agree or disagree. So the reliability uh, um, scientifically of these of these illnesses are, is is abysmal. Therefore, what does that mean scientifically? They're not really constructs that you want to be even doing research on. If you if you have something that you're declaring a construct that's questionably valid. Um, like uh, oppositional divine disorder, but even if you believe it is valid, but if it's clearly unquestionably unreliable, so in other words, you can't get people to agree on who's an oppositional divine, so you can't get people to agree on who's anxious, who's got anxiety disorder, who's got depression. It, it, different pe- people act differently with different clinicians. Clinicians view people differently. The way people are, are diagnosed is basically through subject reports and, and doctor's interpretations. There's no blood... EEG or blood test or any kind of objective data. So that it's just fuck chock full of unreliability. So you've got constructs that, like I say, are questionable validity, totally unquestionably unreliable. And then and then you go ahead and leap into doing scientific studies associating them with all kinds of stuff, including genetics and brain difficulties, which is absurd. It's crazy. You're you're going in. It would be the same for me as if you're you know you're, you you decided okay let's go let's go see the brain scan of of of, of whatever one of the famous illnesses in America is just some, something called drapetomania. A lot of folks who are critics of psychiatry know about the illness in the 1850s. A guy named a physician named Samuel Cartwright declared um of uh, uh, slaves who were running away from their plantation guilty of the mental illness of drapetomania. So. This is obviously, hopefully today, for almost all Americans, viewed as an invalid illness, just as homosexuality is invalid. And so, you know, you've got those two basic issues that make this DSM Bible of uh, psychiatric diagnoses as scientific as the other Bible, as Deuteronomy and, and, and Genesis and all that. In other words, they're not. They're not. They're just narratives. They're just stories. They're, they have very little to do, oh, nothing to do with science. So is there even such a thing as ADHD? Again, ADHD, there's certainly folks out there who have a difficulty paying attention to anything. And nowadays, for a variety of reasons, you'd be hard pressed to find many people who can't pay attention to anything between. And there's a lot of reasons for this that we could go into. Socially, what's happened is started really with television. People were talking about huge increases of ADHD just with television. Now when you've got you know computers and the internet and video games and all that, and that's just one of the reasons why kids can't pay attention. To, and, and most of the way ADHD is diagnosed is through kids not being able to pension, pay attention in a classroom. Well, given all these other ways they're getting stimulated, you know, I almost I could I never got diagnosed with ADHD. But if I was playing video games, had all this Internet stimulation, all this kind of stuff that was going on, you know, not just three or four channels on a television set, you know, I'd have ADHD, too. So, you know, it's, it's certainly a case where a lot of people have difficulty paying attention. If you give them speed, which is what all these ADHD drugs are, you know, Vyvanse and Ritalin and Adderall, Adderall and Vyvanse are amphetamines, they're speed. So if you give them speed, they're going to be able to focus on very, you know, concrete things. Are they going to be able to be more creative and do all, you know, really, you know, think critically about things? No. You know, that, you know, amphetamine speeds, you know, make it, it enables you to pay attention on gross, gross kind of skills. But the idea that just because people, a lot of folks out there have difficulty paying attention to things, that they they automatically have a disease, a mental illness, is ludicrous. It certainly doesn't mean that there's a a chemical imbalance in their brain. There's absolutely no proof of of any of these chemical imbalances. By the way, I should tell you another chemical imbalance thing they used to shove down people's throat was that um, people who were schizophrenic had a, a chemical imbalance the other way. They said they, they claimed they had too much dopamine, too much dopamine, not too little. And so they did a whole bunch of research on that. And by the 1980s, that theory was discounted. So a lot of the ways these chemical imbalance theories come into being, I mean, I know a lot of people in your audience are going to just think that I can't believe this is how they come up with it. But this is what they do. They find some drug that works. So they know, for example, that Prozac for certain, maybe 30, 35 percent of people out there, you know, lifts their depression. OK, and they know Prozac creates more serotonin in a synapse 
for a, you know, a period of time. And so therefore, they jump to the conclusion that therefore somebody must have had too little serotonin. Well, this is as ludicrous logic as saying, well, somebody who, um, uh, somebody who is very shy and, and socially constricted had a, you know, took a bunch of alcohol and they became extroverted at a party. Therefore, they must have had a alcohol um, deficiency imbalance. You know, that's about as <laughs> ludicrous as reasoning. Yeah, no, that, that puts that into perspective. Yeah, yeah. In a state of shock after the war. We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Calibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Calibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... Now, another thing that you talk about in your writing quite a bit is how people in the psychiatric and psychological professions are themselves trained to think in narrow ways, and so they are not able to understand their patients in a lot of cases. And uh, one thing that you wrote in a, a great essay called Why Anti-Authoritarians Are Diagnosed as Mentally Ill was, in my career as a psychologist, I have talked with hundreds of people previously diagnosed by other professionals with oppositional defiance disorder, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, anxiety disorder, and other psychiatric illnesses. And I'm struck by, one, how many of those diagnosed are essentially anti-authoritarians, and two, how those professionals who have diagnosed them are not. Right. I mean, one of the, one of the funny things again before psychiatry, psychiatry, it was it was much more much more a diverse place in the 1970s, 1980s. You had a lot more thinking psychiatrists back then, and so you had guys thinking about these issues. There's a guy like a pretty unknown uh, uh, article in the New York Times in the early 80s it was about uh, Soviet psychiatry, and back then there was this idea that um, like you know psychiatry it was well known that a lot of political dissidents, this was uncontroversial, that a lot of political dissidents in the Soviet Union were being diagnosed with psychiatric disorders. One of the famous ones they'd used in the Soviet Union was something they invented called sluggish schizophrenia. Um, and they were they and, and that and they were then, you know, hospitalized, you know, and that was a way of marginalizing dissidents. Um, in the Soviet Union, but a guy, a psychiatrist, interesting guy, he really, a guy named Reich studied this, nothing, no relationship to the famous Wilhelm Reich, but another guy named Walter Reich, he, um, he studied this, and he said that really, uh, it wasn't just like uh, these psychiatrists, like, uh, like, curring favor with, um, the, with the KGB in the Soviet Union, they actually believed that these dissidents were mentally ill, I mean, what he said was, was really interesting, he said, look, he said, think about it, you know, for most Soviet citizens, and, and psychiatrists were like most Soviet citizens, they said, like, it, you know, it, for them, it was bizarre for somebody to question the conditions of Soviet political life. Everybody, you know, in Soviet Union knew how dangerous that was. And if somebody was willing to do that, they must be crazy, you know, and this is, and so like the psychiatrists there in the Soviet Union, they actually... You know, they actually believe this person's got to be crazy if they're if they're calling into question. I mean, these guys, these political dissidents, they would go to the you know KGB and they would you know talk about their rights under the Soviet Constitution. For your average Soviet citizen, you're you're a lunatic to do that. Everybody knew that the Soviet Constitution didn't count, but these dissidents would do that, and so they would look crazy according to these psychiatrists. Well, it's, it's, most Americans get a chuckle out of that, but the same parallel kinds of things have happened here in the United States. So, for example, a guy, um, a guy in the in the um, in the 1980s, um, I wrote a book about how, like, uh, 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 called the protest, the protest psychoses in uh, in America. You know about how, like, this guy named John, uh, Metzl, uh, Jonathan Metzl, he wrote a book called the Protest Psycho Psychosis about how African Americans, and he was studying mostly in Detroit, how, like, if they were, you know, politically active, um, part of the, like, black power movement in, De in Detroit, you know, they, they would be viewed more likely as being crazy. They would get more labeled as schizophrenia. they get put in because for, their, for their protesting because they would look, they would look crazy to these psychiatrists, how, you know, and so, 
So that's what happens. And I think a lot of the population, my major benefit of going to my graduate training where I hung out with a lot of clinical psychologists and hung out with a lot of uh, resident psychiatrists was a shockingly discovery of like, I never viewed myself as the most radical, you know, non-compliant person in the world. After all, you know, I'd done pretty well in school, you know, I had, you know, I had done what I was supposed to do. I wasn't this really radical person. But these people that I went to school with, they were the most compliant people I ever met in my life. They were terrified to even assert themselves with even some dumb professor. I mean, it was sort of shocking for me. So here you have this population. Of course, there's exceptions to these, to this, what I'm saying here. A lot of them end up quitting or they get in trouble. But... For the most part, you have this population that's incredibly compliant. When they and they come, when they see any kind of client out there who is non-compliant and they're behaving oppositionally, yeah, they must have this mental illness, oppositional defiant disorder, or they're doing some wild, crazy stuff. Maybe making some poor, rat, risky judgments. Oh my God, they must be, you know, manic disorder. They must be bipolar. So they have a kind of skewed, kind of compliant, conformist kind of view that they don't even recognize in themselves. And and you know this is a really you know a crucial kind of thing for people to understand when you when you go see a, a mental health professional and you know they they're also too a lot of these folks maybe even have some shame about their own degree of compliance their own degree of lack of assertiveness with authority so when they see somebody who is bolder who is more non-compliant who is more anti-authoritarian it's going to create more anxiety for them they have to make a decision well was i gutless or are you crazy well you know how that's going to turn out most of the time yeah totally totally yeah later in that same essay uh, you also add uh, americans have been increasingly socialized to equate inattention anger anxiety and immobilizing despair with a medical condition and to seek medical treatment rather than political remedies. What better way to maintain the status quo than to view inattention, anger, anxiety, and depression as biochemical problems of those who are mentally ill rather than normal reactions to an increasingly authoritarian society? Right, right. You know, I mean, uh, you were talking about the Catholic Church before, but and again, you know, the, the analogy for me, again, is like if you could get a population to believe that all their emotional suffering and their you know, disturbing behaviors, if you could get them to believe that they're all caused by non-social variables, non-political variables, and it doesn't really matter if you get them to believe it's God's will or not complying with the Catholic dogma or, or it's because of their defects in biochemistry or their non-compliance with their medication, if you can get them to believe all of that, rather than it's being caused by, you know, all these kind of social variables that benefit the ruling elite. I mean, you know, that's more powerful from my point of view, or at least as powerful, maybe more powerful in maintaining the status quo than, than, than a heavily armed police force. Yeah, no, it's definitely very effective at doing so. And I mean, if we look at the social forces in the United States and how things have been changing over the last few decades, uh, most things have been getting worse for most people. In terms of uh, inflation, wages have been going down, hourly wages, since the early 70s. The uh, inflation has been insane, how much it costs just to buy a loaf of bread at this point. Now, in the last few years, gentrification of any city of any size at all. And I saw uh, something a few months ago that, that said uh, there is now not a single state in the United States where a full-time job on minimum wage will afford you a two-bedroom apartment. And something else I heard recently is that even as women entered the workplace increasingly during the 70s, household wealth itself did not go up because everyone was making less. So you had more people working but making less. And so I think that we live in a, a society that's been in decline for a while and which over the last couple of years now seems to be in an obvious collapse. And so obviously this is going to cause a lot of different emotional reactions in people that are all completely natural. Right, exactly. I mean, there's a, you know, here's a you know, really important thing, you know, for people to keep in mind, there's absolutely no correlation between <laughs> serotonin levels and depression, but there's a lot of correlations between exactly what you're talking about and depression and serious mental difficulty. So for example, there was a 2013 uh, study that I quote a lot mental health. And they found, you know, when you, you take a look 
at people's uh, suicide, for example, their their su their 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 suicide attempts. If you compare um, unemployed people to employed people, just that one symbol, it's, you're four times more likely to make a suicide attempt if you're unemployed. Big surprise, right? If you got any common sense out there, that is no big surprise, right? So you see on all of those kinds of mentions, you know, you're like, you know. Much, you know, much more likely to make a suicide attempt. You're much more likely, if you're if, if you're impoverished, to be depressed, have serious mental difficulties. You're much more likely to be suicidal or have serious mental difficulties if you have involvement in the criminal justice system. So if you're on parole or probation. So therefore, instead of all this nonsense, you know, you could probably fix a lot more of people's misery than, you know, in terms of depression and these so-called mental illnesses by making sure, really making sure that no one gets involved unnecessarily in the criminal justice system, which you could do rather easily around the United States by, by doing all kinds of, uh, you know, drug legalization, drug decriminalization, so that they're, they're not on parole, not on probation. And that's going to be much more of an antidote to suicidality than any kind of medical treatment, which maybe makes it worse in a lot of cases. And so this is an important thing. Now, a lot of folks who are listening out there, again, the issue of science, they're going like, well, Bruce, you're, you're just talking about correlations. You know, somebody could be suicidal because they're unemployed, or they could be unemployed because they're suicidal. And that's right. That's exactly right. That Those are correlations. But the important thing to keep in mind here is that there's not even correlations between chemical imbalances and depression and suicidality. So at least we know there are correlations between these things like uh, unemployment and, and, and poverty and, and involvement in criminal justice system with these mental health issues. And so the question is, politically, if you had a sane political society, you would be investigating scientifically, you know, these things that at least have correlations rather than wasting billions and billions of dollars on things that aren't even correlated. Absolutely. And I also think that it goes even deeper that the system itself that we live in here, which, you know, some people call, you know, settler colonialism is itself based on brutality and based on violence uh, from the very beginning, based on theft. And that that is something that has never changed. So first we came here, uh, uh, we, we, we stole land, we enslaved people in order to get resources together and make ourselves wealthy. Uh, then after World War II, we developed a, a global empire, you know, and, you know, even now there's so much suffering and brutality that we are visiting upon the rest of the world. I mean, there's the drone wars, there's the troops, you know, in all the countries around the world. The, the, the children who are digging up the rare earth minerals, you know, for our phones, you know, who, who are suffering. I mean, so at a deeper level, all of us here are, if not complicit, uh, at least benefiting from a system which is just profoundly immoral. Right. And one of the things that's happened in American society is because we were creating, you know, there was all this. Uh, traumatization that were going on to all kinds of populations domestically and internationally because of our social system no one wanted to really you know take a look at the fact that that's really the major reason why people have emotional and physical health problems but one of the good things we should say one of the more positive things that have happened in recent years was uh, this kind of well-known study, well, at least in certain circles, it's very well-known, called the Adverse Childhood Experiences, this ACE study, which like measured um, people's level of, of abuse when they were kids, you know, another physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, with what happened to them later on. And you see this huge, uh, again, this huge correlation between, um, you know, if, if they've had a lot of abuse, um, when they're uh, uh, in terms of those kinds of uh, events happening to them, um, where it's much more likely to be make a suicide attempt or become a problem drinker or to inject illegal drugs, and so you see, for some elements of society, people are getting it. The most important things that create, and this should be common sense if you had a sane society, but we don't. But if you had a sane society, you would realize the most important variables that create all of these so-called you know, mental illnesses, these emotional difficulties, these behavioral disturbances have to do with trauma, you know, um, societal trauma, family trauma. And then you and then you say, like, well, why does 
you know, then if you dug a little deeper and say, why, why is there so much family trauma? Why do parents beat the hell out of their kids, sexually abuse them? Well, it goes to what you're talking about, that you have a whole society economically where these people are being traumatized. And so if you're working in some crap job that you hate, that you're totally alienated from, that you're getting humiliated, you're not getting paid, when you come home and your kid does a little frustrating thing, you're not going to be able to be that great of a parent. You're going to be much more likely be able to you know when you're frustrated by your kid spilling some milk you know do something really abusive with them so it's a kind of whole vicious cycle of a social system where everybody's getting abused and and everybody and, and, and adds to trauma and if you really really wanted to dig and you really wanted to deal create a much more mentally healthy society where you didn't have you know people young people second leading cause of death among people under 35 is suicide in America. If you really cared about that kind of stuff, you would you would see some obvious reasons that we have a society with a lot of abuse, a lot of trauma that's being created by the nature of the culture and the nature of the society. Trauma. I've been thinking a lot about that one lately and how I feel like my own traumas that I experienced uh, throughout my life with different people, I, I've just really been feeling how I, it has led to a lot of uh, distrust, for example, even this late in my life. It's like, oh, I feel sort of fundamentally distrusting of people because of the number of negative experiences that I've had with them over the course of my life, going all the way back to, you know, of course, being raised Catholic, which I feel is a form of child abuse all by itself, honestly. Well, there's a lot of folks like you out there who feel the same way. And, and, part, and also, when you think about it in a kind of capitalistic um, cold capitalistic way, you want to have a society where everybody distrusts everybody because that's going to create more consumerism. That's going to create um, less, certainly less union solidarity. You're going to create less connectedness to be able to uh, change the basic hierarchy of society. So it's, it's a win for those at the very top of society who are exploiting, who are making a ton of money to have everybody distrust one another there. So that's not going to change from the top, okay? If you want to create a more, a less abusive, less traumatizing, more trustful society, it's going to have to change from the bottom. Right. And yet, and at the same time, it's not as though there is a uh, omniscient conspiracy at the top planning all of this and rubbing their hands together and saying, how can we keep everyone separated? I think that, that they too are uh, unwillingly or unknowingly most of the time part of it themselves. No, I agree with you. There's not a conscious conspiracy, but there's not there's forces around that that are OK with it. OK, so you don't right. have, like, you know, and so like you have people benefiting. I should put it that way. That there's a lot of benefits to be made financially by having people being distrusting of one another out there. So even though you may not have a conscious conspiracy of people you know, putting their hands together, figure out how we can get people to more distrust one another. You don't have a lot of incentive for people who are, have the power and influence in society to want to change this thing. Right, because you don't want to rock the boat. And ironically enough, I think you don't want to rock the boat more to the degree that you are powerful within the system. Right. I mean, it's a big win for the people at the top of the society. I mean, you know, when you have people not trusting, for example, labor unions, when people like you've got convinced the society that that all labor unions are like Jimmy Hoffer and the, and, and the Teamsters, corrupt places where you're, you're, you're getting used and exploited. And, and that certainly wasn't the case in the labor history. There are a lot of labor unions where people actually were, were caring about one another and they gain great benefits for, for their workers. But that's not a good story to be told for the people at the top. And therefore, it's been very effective. You had, like, once upon a time, in that short period when working class people in America from the end of World War II to the 1970s, where you could make a living, you know, working, you know, without a college education, you could raise a family, you could do all those kinds of things. We had about 35% of Americans in pretty strong unions, most of them not corrupt, like the Teamsters and a couple of the others. But now, you know, it was the great boon to all of these folks at the top, from the guys running Amazon, Bezos, to Bill, all of these characters who run a thing, to have people feel that unions are all corrupt and, and don't join them, you know, because that's, that's really the only way that people who are powerless can have any power if they trust one another. And that attacking the unions, that really has been a huge thing since, you know, Reagan and the uh, firing air traffic controllers. It's really been all downhill since then for the unions. 
1980. That was a big year. In 1980s, like uh, like a hallmark year for me. Reagan gets elected, you know, and oppositional defiant disorder comes in the DSM. So for me, it's a real clear case of the end of the 1960s, 70s, a, a brief period of anti-authoritarianism in America history, where a lot of interesting things, by the way, were happening in psychiatry in the 1960s, 1970s, um, a lot of good things, and, and throughout the rest of the society. And then you had this, you know, this uh, reactionary um, movement across the board from uh, uh, at the top with Ronald Reagan and even in psychiatry. That, that psychiatry has become, I mean, it's really interesting for me. If you were in the 1960s, 1970s, people were very well aware that it was a more left view to view, to view people hurting out there and being miserable and unhappy because of social conditions. And it was a very right-wing view to view it as sort of biological defects. And one of the really you know, great victories for, um, psychi- for psychiatry and for the right in America is for nowadays people who consider themselves liberals and progressives to have totally bought into a kind of right-wing view of mental uh, suffering. Yeah, as I said, I've never really thought of my myself as as having a, a disorder in that in that sense, and yet I feel like there's maybe perhaps a, a risk, or could there be a risk in me looking at my own issues that I you know continue to experience over my life, and to always be blaming it on society because well, there is something that's mine too, right? Right. I mean, you know, part of it is if you really, you know, it, it, it's not about just blaming society. It's about like taking a look at, at, at gain, and gaining more empowerment, you know, as opposed to viewing yourself just sort of a defective, defected creature, um, a defect of your parenting or a defect of your biology or just defective. But viewing just the reality of what caused trauma and therefore if you can sort of see how these traumas can create sort of misery in anybody, then you can come back to the human race and realize that human beings can also heal. You know, they can they can suffer um, of, from trauma and, and, and abuse and be damaged, but they can also heal. And a lot of this can go on um, by a person on their own or with peers who care about them. And there's not a need necessarily to have professionals to be involved. There's not necessarily to sort of comply with a hierarchy. Um, so a lot of it is about um, caring about uh, how can you truly be empowered. Right. And it sounds as if also you're saying have a uh, true community as well. Sure. That is vital. And you, and if you take a look, uh, you know, even for people in the side, there's whole communities out there, again, under the radar, sort of a kind of an underground radical movement of people who've been diagnosed with these so-called serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, who have been failed miserably by psychiatry, who have made their life even worse, and who have abandoned them. And, you know, psychiatrists and medical practitioners, they're, they're unaware of them. That's why they go around thinking it's an uncurable condition, because there's a lot of people who on their own form peer support uh, groups where they where they help one another. And um, you can you can see a lot of, you know, I, I write about a lot of these. There's a website called uh, Madden America where a lot of folks who are part of these communities um, will talk about how they help each other heal. And, you know, just on a real simple level, when people are helping one another, um, their whole identity changes. So you could, you know, somebody could be like 10 years in and out of psychiatric hospitals, always the patient, always being, you know, at the mercy of what different drug that psychiatrist is going to prescribe, never being in a helper role themselves. And when they're in these peer supports, there's always somebody who's in worse shape than you are in. No matter how bad a shape you're in, there's always somebody worse and you can help them. And that dramatically changes your identity. So helping and being, helping just like being loved is as important as loving, you know, helping is as important as being helped. Exactly. That's like the converse side to what I was talking about before, about how our nation, not only are we experiencing trauma from our parents or authorities, etc., but we are inflicting trauma on the rest of the world. And so so what you're describing there is, is a really, that's a way of, of reversing that. Right. Right. It's real important for people to recognize that one of the real sort of sad things away, sad things that have taken away 
um, in a, like true from when, when when you don't have true democracy, when you don't have true participatory democracy, you know it's obvious for a lot of folks you lose you, all these obvious political power issues, things that you lose political power. But what also happens is, is you don't you lose you lose the kind of therapeutic healing um, power of like being helping and being helped. What what the anarchists used to call mutual aid. Um, which these current uh, ex uh, former psychiatric patients will call peer to peer support, and this is a huge way that people can only not only gain political power but also heal. That sounds very inspirational. I've heard just a little bit about it, but now I want to know more for sure. Yeah, what kinds of things do you look for if you want to find out more about these groups? I would just uh, just a quickie uh, a recommendation. The, the the kind of go to website for a lot of uh, dissident mental health professionals, dissident, and there are a handful of dissident psychiatrists, there's a few more dissident psychologists, dissident mental health professionals, and there's a lot, large group of uh, former um, mental health patients, ex, some of them folks call themselves psychiatric survivors, some of people view themselves more positively, this is sort of uh, a, a people who've had lived experience of an altered state, but these are all people who are clearly been troubled and upset by psychiatry doing more damage than good. And the go-to site um, that was created by a guy named Robert Whitaker, I'll talk to you a little bit about him in a second, is something called madinamerica.com, uh, madinamerica.com. And, Madden Amer- and Robert Whitaker is an interesting guy. I mean, he's a, a journalist, not a mental health professional, not a former patient, um, but he's a guy who was actually, um, he wrote a series for the Boston Globe that was nominated for Pulitzer Prize that, that viewed, looked at the uh, the abuses in research and psychiatry, and he got into just trying to get a feel of like what the hell is going on in psychiatry. And his first book he wrote about the history of psychiatry in America called Mad in America. And then um, about 10 years later, he wrote this book that really got real popular. Um, it was a book called Anatomy of an Epidemic, which the gist of it was some of what we were talking about here before on how how these psychiatric drugs and you and he looked at it from a lot of various different ev- kinds of evidence that overall although it might be helping some people on a short-term basis it was taking um sort of episodic problems and creating kind of chronic conditions and so you had this swelling doubling of uh, uh, disability roles in america you had you know just more people who are not getting recovering from 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 their problems so so that's robert whitaker who's a journalist and he created this mad, mad in america website and I, I write for them, um, and, and a lot of other. It's you, you can if somebody's out there in your audience who has had some difficulties, they want to tell their own story. Um, there's a place for that on that man in America. There's also um, reports. Um, so he's got a he's got a group of reporters who comb through their scientific journals and they put out you know and they give summaries of the studies and there's just blogs. So it's it's if you're interested in the stuff that I'm talking about, it's definitely the I would say the key go-to website. I read an interview that you did with Robert Whitaker this afternoon. Right. Yeah, I've done a few for him. I've done one for Truth. I did for Truth Out. A, a few interviews with Robert Whitaker for Truth Out. I, his, uh, he did a, a more recent book um, with a, his, uh, a psychologist um, about it's, it's about this basically the corruption. Um, in, 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 in psychiatry called Under the Influence, and it talks about this whole sort of uh, institutional corruption, sort of comparing what goes on in psychiatry um, to like what goes on in Congress. So, you know, you got all these guys in Congress who are, you know, legally corrupt, you know, they're all taking all these, you know, <laughs> all these money from lobbyists, and it's all, you know, reported, it's all above on the table, and they're wanting to kind of convince themselves that it doesn't influence them. Well, of course, everybody knows it influences them. And the same exact thing happens in psychiatry. Every every component of psychiatry from the American Psychiatric Association, which is like I said before, the Guild of American Psychiatry, to the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, which is this sort of consumer group of uh, you know ex you know, family members of people who've been diagnosed with mental illness, to um, to these journals, to every you can't find anything in psychiatry that these drug companies haven't you know haven't donated a ton of money to because they're not stupid. They know you toss a few million here, a few million there, and that's how you make billions. They they spend millions to make billions to have a degree of influence over every way that anybody, from patients, consumers to um, no, journalists to doctors, every way that they, 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 they think they learn about, they, they think they're learning information about drugs is really in some ways being orchestrated financially. And it's very difficult 
you know, to find anything out there. But one of the places that you will find some stuff that isn't controlled because they're very, 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 very critical of, of not being controlled by drug companies. One of the few places that are not taking any kind of drug company money, this Man in America website, and, and all the and professionals who write for them, including myself. That's great. I, I was wondering if you had an opinion about Oregon in this uh, last election here, uh, legalized psilocybin mushrooms for therapeutic use. And I remember seeing some of the commercials that the pro psilocybin people put out uh, before the election, and they were featuring a, a, a man who had PTSD from being a veteran. And uh, I was very pleasantly surprised to see that the psilocybin measure passed there this first time. I was wondering if you had an um, opinion about that. Yeah, I mean, I got mixed feelings only because I see the history of like, of like sort of co-opting and imperialism of psychiatry and the profession of what happens institutionally to things that even may be a good idea. So, you know, for example, this like peer to peer support, which is completely created by ex patients, you know, to help one another. Well, a lot of a lot of hospitals now use that, and these people are at the lowest rungs, and they're being like paid minimal wages to try to convince people to take their medication. Or you see this kind of thing like twelve step. Um, AA, which originally was, it was kind of a, you know, uh, you know, peer to, you know, peer support, mutual aid, quasi anarchist kind of thing that, that was used that people who had all problem drinkers help one another. And, you know, the medical establishment fought AA and 12 steps for many years until they realized how powerful it was. And then they co-opted them. And so now before you know it, you've got, you've got the, um, you've got the court systems and the medical establishment kind of coercing people to be in 12 step, you know, or else like, you know, have to go to prison or something like that and completely um, subverting the, the, the spirit of, of 12 step. So, you know, I, I always have mixed feelings given the history of some good th ideas being ruined by their co-optation and imperialism of being taken over at a professional level. And, and that's why I, that is partially in the early stages where I'm looking at like, um, at, at this whole thing of using uh, psychedelic psilocybin and others. And I've talked to folks, you know, in this, this world who've been ther using this stuff therapeutically in parts of the world for, uh, uh, for a lot of their careers and, 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 and see value in it. But they're worried about the same kind of thing that I just talked about. Ah, uh, okay. So that basically once it comes out there, then it's in danger of being co-opted. Right. Right, and professionalized. And so a lot of folks, for example, who have effectively used uh, um, psychedelic psilocybin and other kinds of things, you know, in, in, in terms of helping people with trauma or, you know, especially PTSD or substance abuse, is a lot that's going along with that. I mean, it's not just the psychedelics. It's, it's a certain spirit. It's a certain atmosphere. It's a certain kind of philosophy. There's a, and there's a certain kind of a peer group. There's a lot of other elements that make it therapeutic and when things get sort of professionalized when capitalism takes over when hierarchy takes over it's just like let's junk companies can figure out a way to like just make money off of off of some off of some lsd or something and it's not it's not the same anymore and that's the tricky thing about all of these things um that it's it's in some ways a really good thing you know with michael pollan's book you know about about this whole thing making it more mainstream and but you know, but people ha should be nervous. So you're, you're a distrusting guy. You were talking about a lot of things. It's good to be distrusting about anything becoming sort of more mainstreamized here, given the history of what's happened to a lot of things. Uh, and, and maybe just to wrap this up, we could talk just for a couple minutes about your most recent book. I, I started flipping through it today, uh, Resisting Illegitimate Authority, A Thinking Person's Guide to Being an Anti-Authoritarian, Strategies, Tools, and Models. I, I was looking through it and really enjoying just the bits of it that I'd seen. Maybe you could talk just a little bit about what it's about. Yeah, I mean, it, it's really a book, like I said, for anti-authoritarians, and it's about them. And in some ways, it started with that article that you talked about a while back about about why anti-authoritarians are diagnosed with mental illness. That I got a lot, probably there's about four or five articles that I've written that have just really kind of gone viral. I get a lot of feedback from, and that one really hit a chord. And so it became clear to me that there was this pretty significant population of people out there who um, really, they were, some of these folks were anarchists, and the book is published by an anarchist publishing house called AK Press, but not all anti-authoritarians 
you know, are anarchists, as I make the case, you know, I, I go through, I profile in that book about 20 different anti-authoritarians, you know, and I wanted to pick people, you know, different, you know, you know, women, men, different, you know, you know, who, you have different backgrounds, all kinds of backgrounds, different eras. And some of these folks are anti-authoritarian. Um, I mean, they're all anti-authoritarians, but some of them are anarchists. I talk about Emma Goldman and Noam Chomsky, but some of them aren't. Like Thomas Paine believed in the state, you know, but he was clearly an anti-authoritarian. And there's some other folks. And so what I wanted to try to do in that book was through specific um, specifics, but also through through stories of all of these folks, kind of give people a feel of like how do you survive if you're an anti-authoritarian in the United States? And because a lot don't, I mean, the, the gist of what happens to a lot of anti-authoritarians is there's a lot of blowback, there's a lot of marginalization, legal marginalization, um, financial marginalization, psychiatric marginalization. There's a lot of ways that the society wants to, um, you know, not deal with anti-authoritarian any which way they can. And a lot of anti-authoritarians, famous and not famous, end up having miserable lives, um, but not all. Uh, some, of, some of them figure out a way, sometimes just through luck, but others through some wisdom in being able to figure out a way to navigate the society that's sort of stacked against anti-authoritarians. And that's what I wanted to kind of talk about in that book. I really found it fascinating. I think I've been you know, whether or not I thought of myself that way or not, I've been an anti-authoritarian basically my whole life, and I don't even know, you know, why it happened. But to see uh, the different distinctions that you were making and the different examples in there, it was really, it was reminding me of something that I've thought of before, which is that as long as there's ever been a mainstream to society, there's always been a side stream as well. So there's always been people outside of, the mainstream who have been looking at it and critiquing it and saying, Hey, this isn't what's this, this isn't working. You know, this is going to lead to a bad place or whatever, like the whole time. Right. And I guess I should say, I usually, I usually, I'm sort of doing this backwards here because the way, the way we were talking here, but I usually, when I used to do a lot of interviews on that book, um, I would say at the very top, I would define what an authoritarian and anti-authoritarian is. And I guess I should do that before your audience, because I'm sure there's a few people out there going, like, what the hell is he, what does he mean by that? So an author, if you, I just use the dictionary definition. Uh, an authoritarian is just somebody who demands unquestioning uh, obedience. And if they are uh, in power, they demand it. And if, and if there's a subordinate, um, they, they provide that unquestioning obedience. So you could either be in control or you can be a subordinate and be an authoritarian. And anti-authoritarians are people who are not necessarily um, against all authority, although some anarchists, this is a debate among anarchists here. That's a whole other issue. But basically an anti-authoritarian is somebody who just does not unquestionably obey authority. They, they, they question they, uh, that authority. They assess whether that authority is legitimate or not legitimate based on uh, their own criteria. For me, the, the criteria most of the anti-authoritarians I talk about in that book or I've known in my life, they're assessing whether the authority um, knows what they're talking about. Just like your anti-authoritarian audience out there, they're assessing me as they're listening. They're going like, does this guy know what he's talking about? Is he exploitative? You know, does he care about you know people who who's trying to help all of those kinds of things and if they assess if an anti-authoritarian assesses an, an authority to be um Ill illegitimate um they're going to challenge they're going to resist that authority and so throughout for me there's there's people who are just more early on in life temperamentally they're anti-authoritarians a lot of these kids are being diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder but it's also interesting that there's a lot of people i talk about in that book um, that, that they're not anti-authoritarian so much they're, they, they come into that later in life. So it's not totally a dispositional um, personality thing, although it is for a lot of folks, it is. But um, it, it's a sort of an interesting kind of thing that, that uh, uh, there's, there's a whole diversity of personalities on uh, temperaments. There's introverted anti-authoritarians. So there's extroverted. There's uh, comedian anti-authoritarians. I talk about in that book, George Carl and Lenny Bruce. But there's also very, um, there's, you know, certainly Noam Chomsky's an anti-authoritarian. Edward Snowden's an anti-authoritarian. There's left anti-authoritarians, anarchists. There's people who consider themselves more libertarian. Um, but, it, but what they have in common is that they just don't accept an authority because that person's an authority. And that is going to create a certain degree of tension and some difficulties for them to the extent their society is more authoritarian or to the extent their family is more authoritarian or their religion or whatever they're in, their school system. It's going to create natural tension. 
Right. And the anti-authoritarian is someone who is uh, looking at things with a critical eye, not automatically making a conclusion until they've looked at something. So being like, okay, here's this person talking to me. I will decide if they are uh, legitimate or illegitimate. And that is uh, contrasted to someone who, uh, I believe you used the word, um, uh, a contrarian, who is simply rejecting all things from all authorities without a critical eye, just for them being authorities. Yeah, I made that early on in the book talk about people who create tension. And the and the contrarian is somebody, it's like, you know, if you got fr if a friend who's a contrarian, whatever you say, they're going to say the opposite. They're just a pain, <laughs> pain in the butt. So you say you want to, you say yes, they say no. That's a contrarian. They're just taking an opposite position. Um, that That's not, the, you know, and there are some people who, you know, they have elements of contrariness and they have elements of anti-authoritarians. But but an anti-authoritarian is not necessarily contrary. I mean, I mean if an anti-authoritarian views um, uh, some authority as like actually knowing what they're talking about and, and they're respecting them, um, they're going to like they're not going to be just uh, uh, re reactively, reflexively contrary. Um, so 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 there's clearly different differences there between somebody who is an anti-authoritarian and, and a contrarian. Right. Yeah. Oh, is there, how, is there anything you'd like to say to, to kind of wrap this all up? No, I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I just, it's just fun talking to you. And I just think that there's just, it's, I think in the, the probably the most problematic time, the kind of sort of connection for me between all the, the COVID-19 and psychiatry is that when people are overwhelmed by fear and they're overwhelmed by anxiety, whether it's like, you know, they're depressed and they're feeling suicidal or they're, or they've got a kid who's depressed and suicidal or they're terrified about, you know, getting COVID-19 or infecting somebody else. When you're overwhelmed by fear, um, understandably so, it's going to it's going to do a job on your critical thinking. People are going to, you know, if you're human, you're much more likely to be less critical thinking. You're much more likely to be coming, you know, to be vulnerable to authorities who look like they know what they're talking about when they have no idea what they're talking about. Oh, but they, but they're very good at looking like they know what they're talking about. I mean, I, and and there's a lot of authorities like that out there in politics, um, you know, and in psychiatry and everywhere else. And so it, it, it's it's just we're all vulnerable to that when we're scared, and 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 we're all vul, you know, and it's and it's just hard to um, do what, and so a big part of what we need to do is help each other reduce our fear, reduce our anxiety, because that's, that's vital to helping us think critically. It's very hard to think critically when we're overwhelmed by fear. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast, and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri. K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. -L -L for more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.